Hello, so this week I am in a different location, so I'm filming on my computer's webcam, so sorry for the quality. And it is also very late at night, so sorry for the lighting. So this week in our class we are covering four different schools of poetry style, and the one I'm going to be discussing today is confessional. This is very much uh, personal, emotional poems dealing with a lot of trauma or getting through a lot of hard times, things like that. When we were reading our little brief introduction to confessional poetry, it mentioned Sylvia Plath, and Sylvia Plath is my favorite author of all time. The Bell Jar is my favorite book. You know that probably if you've been following me for a while. So I kind of was familiar with that style in a way. I'm very familiar with Plath's poems and how deeply emotional they get. So I kind of had that sort of background when reading this stuff. I would say that uh, the confessional poetry has by far been my favorite school of style, whatever poetry, um, that we've learned this week. It's probably been some of my favorite poems we've read during the class so far. So this week we are supposed to read slash perform a poem from one of these schools and kind of talk about how parts of the poem contribute to the poem as a whole. So I will be reading The Fish by Elizabeth Bishop, and I love this poem already. The first time I read it, I was in love. So let's get to it. I caught a tremendous fish and held him beside the boat, half out of water, with my hook fast in the corner of his mouth. He didn't fight. He hadn't fought at all. He hung a grunting weight battered and venerable and homely. Here and there his brown skin hung in strips like ancient wallpaper, and its pattern of darker brown was like wallpaper, shapes like full-blown roses stained and lost through age. He was speckled with barnacles, fine rosettes of lime, and infested with tiny white sea lice, and underneath two or three rags of green weed hung down. While his gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen, the frightening gills fresh and crisp with blood that can cut so badly. I thought of the coarse white flesh packed in like feathers, the big bones and the little bones, the dramatic reds and blacks of his shiny entrails, and the pink swim bladder like a big peony. I looked into his eyes which were far larger than mine, but shallower, and yellowed, the irises backed and packed with tarnished tin foil, seen through the lenses of old scratched ice and glass. They shifted a little, but not to return my stare. It was more like the tipping of an object toward the light. I admired his sullen face, the mechanism of his jaw, and then I saw that from his lower lip, if you could call it a lip, grim, wet, and weapon-like, hung five old pieces of fish line, or four in a wire leader with the swivel still attached, with all their five big hooks grown firmly in his mouth. A green line frayed at the end where he broke it, two heavier lines, and a fine black thread still crimped from the strain and snap when it broke and he got away. Like metals with their ribbons, frayed and wavering, a five-haired beard of wisdom, trailing from his aching jaw. I stared and stared, and victory filled up the little rented boat, from the pool of bilge where oil had spread a rainbow, around the rusted engine, to the baler rusted orange, the sun-cracked ports, the oarlocks on their strings, the gunnels, until everything was rainbow, 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 and I let the fish go. So overall, if we're talking basic bottom line stuff. This is a poem about somebody who's gone on a fishing trip, caught a fish, and then saw how much the fish has been through and let go. Okay, that's the part down version. <laughs> if I'm going more into like deeper meanings and symbolism and things like that, this is a poem about the tipping point when your worldview changes, when you have a hard decision or a hard situation or life just keeps throwing you curveball after curveball after curveball. You work through it and you persevere through it and you get through it. I mean, it's a poem about survival. It's a life lesson about what you have to do to get through life. So there are a couple parts of this poem that I want to talk about. Um, we're supposed to talk about, pull out certain parts of the poem and talk about the imagery and the symbolism and any metaphors and things like that and then we kind of try and talk about how they relate to the poem as a whole and how it helps the poem come together as one single unit. The first part I'm going to talk about is in the first like on the first page of the poem in our book um, which is kind of 
a big chunk when she's describing all of these things that are wrong with the fish. Speckled with barnacles, fine rosettes of lime, and infested with tiny white sea lice, and underneath two or three rags of green weed hung it down. Then she goes on to talk about the gills and how they're like breathing oxygen and he's, the fish is dying. Um, but this part kind of really <laughs> makes you care about the fish. I mean, it's weird to say because a lot of people like to go fishing for recreation. I think that part kind of gripped me as being, as a person invested in what's going to happen to this character in the poem. I mean, it's kind of like when you're introduced to a new character in a story and you kind of get attached to them and their journey and what's going to happen. I think she did a lot with this imagery and it's really, really potent imagery and I can just imagine this happening out in a lake where I am in Minnesota. So that part kind of gives you a lot of good something to hold on to in the poem when you start reading it. The second part I want to talk about is kind of like the turning point of the poem, which is when the narrator sees the old um, bits of hooks and fish line that are still attached to this fish. And then I saw that from his lower lip, if you could call it a lip, grim, wet, and weapon-like hung five old pieces of fish line, or four and a wire leader with the swivel still attached with all their five big hooks grown firmly in his mouth. So I think this part is really, I mean, it's meant to be that like turning point in the poem. It's one of those like epiphany moments that I think is really important in confessional poetry. When I think of confessional poetry and you think of a lot of poets that are, you know, related to this style of poetry, um, it's a lot of very deep internal stuff like depression and you're dealing with thoughts of suicide and things like that and so obviously this poem is supposed to be more of a metaphor for some type of hardship or some type of trauma or you know a hard decision maybe that um, Bishop has probably had to make in her life. So we all have those moments when we're caught in this hard you know situation and we have a moment when we're just like clicks or it just shifts and we kind of make our decision on that and our whole worldview changes. So this part of the poem is supposed to kind of be that part for the narrator and what I like about this is because she's taking this tipping point epiphany idea in a very normal, relatable, monotonous type of scene. This kind of makes it really personal and very intense, even though fishing is not a very intense activity. I really liked that part, but my favorite part is the next part that I'll talk about. Like metals with their ribbons, frayed and wavering, a five-haired beard of wisdom trailing from his aching jaw. I really liked relating the fish hooks and the fish wire to metals, and um, talking about a five-haired beard of wisdom. This kind of goes also back to metaphor of getting through hard times, surviving things, and coming out on top. I liked that she kind of took this metaphor as a way, as a type of encouragement for people who might be going through hard times. Um, I mean, I've read a little bit of her biography, <laughs> and she has gone through a lot. So I'm I kind of see her working, using this poem as a way to work through some of the hardships she faced. And also this kind of sets up a bit of foreshadowing, a bit of a precedent for what happens in the end when she lets the fish go. So again, it goes back to caring for the fish, the fish becoming a character in this poem, and developing a personality and a backstory and things like that. But she also uses it as a way to connect with readers who might be going through a hard time or making a hard decision or trying to get through, just get through something until it ends. So I really liked Bishop's poem. Again, I liked a lot of the confessional poets, um, especially Anne Sexton. Hers were amazing, so I will probably put links to Elizabeth Bishop and Anne Sexton and maybe Robert Lowell as well. I wasn't that crazy about Lowell, but maybe you will be, I don't know. So check out those links downstairs. Again, um, link there was a link down there to my Twitter and my Instagram and my Tumblr, so you can see other um, posts for class that we've done throughout the week for each unit. 
And so those are all marked with hashtag MH335, which is our class hashtag if you want to follow for whatever reason you may. And I think that is all for this week. I will talk to you guys later. Bye.